Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about a study in Scarlet. I've never read any Sherlock Holmes before and I don't know exactly why I decided to do it. I guess the Get Shit Done Readathon. I was panicking about getting through the challenges and I was like, Lord of the Rings counts for like a bunch of different ones of these. So I think I officially slated it as, I don't know, I decided to like shift things around and I was like, I'll read this for my classic because <laughs> it's actually really short, which I also didn't realize. For some reason, I imagined Sherlock Holmes books to be like tomes, which I mean, I was clearly wrong. So yeah, I have seen like nearly every adaptation there is of Sherlock Holmes. I love, I think I talked about this in my like chatty get ready with me video, but when I'm watching movies and TV shows, I watch like mainly whodunits. I love that, but I don't really read them. I don't, the few times I have, I haven't, oh, that's not true. I grew up reading exclusively Nancy Drew. Like I pretty much read nothing but Nancy Drew until I discovered Harry Potter, but I didn't care for Poirot when I read Poirot and I love all the adaptations of Poirot. Like all, I've seen like all the David Suchet ones. I've seen all the Marples. I've seen all the Sherlock Holmes. I've seen pretty much any Agatha Christie adaptation there is. I love, um, uh, Wilkie Collins, like uh, The Woman in White and The Moonstone, stuff like that. So I love that kind of stuff, but I don't read it. And I guess I always imagined Sherlock Holmes to be really dry, really boring, and really long. And I don't, I don't know again why I decided now to, to be like, oh, my, oh, I was watching, re-watching Sherlock. And I thought to myself for some reason that I want to know what the book's actually like. So I read A Study in Scarlet and I actually, I read it on Kindle, not on this paper copy, which is relevant because there's a part in it where I genuinely was concerned that I had got like a, a weird shitty glitchy copy because it all of a sudden like the story is just like about something else for like a huge chunk of it. And I was just like, is this still a study on Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle because what is this? What is going on right here? What is this doing here? But all that to say, I did really super enjoy it a lot more than I thought I would. And the character of Sherlock Holmes, he's not like he's portrayed in like any adaptation, which is shocking to me because obviously there's a, there is a lot of variety in the adaptations and in the portrayals and interpretations of the character from the old black and white ones with Basil Rathbone, which I have seen all of. I'm telling you, I love whodunits <laughs> to the various BBC ones. Like the guy from My Fair Lady, he was in like a made for TV, like a few made for TV ones. Rupert Everett played him. I think Michael Caine played him. Obviously most recently Benedict Cumberbatch has played him. Obviously also Robert Downey Jr. There's a very, there's a big variety in terms of who's played him and how they've chosen to interpret the character. But one thing that's kind of carried throughout is that he is kind of an aloof asshole and like really condescending. And he is, but in the book, he honestly struck me a lot more as being like the doctor in Doctor Who or Jacoby in Jacoby. There's a, a fun quality, a quirky quality, a, a self-deprecating quality to Sherlock. And and yes, self-deprecating. I stand by that because he is snobby and he is very, he's very confident in his own abilities, but he also doesn't care that much about not getting credit for it. He just, he's like, it's enough for him to know that he got it right and that he knows more than everybody else, but he's not cruel. He really didn't come off as cruel to me. Like, it's just like he loves the puzzle of it and having the puzzle is enough for him. He doesn't care that he doesn't get credit for it in for, you know, in the public at large or that the, the detectives who work for the police, they get credit for it. He doesn't care. He's just like, I know more than you and I don't need anyone else to like boost my ego because my ego is just fine. Which have reminded me a lot more of the doctor in Doctor Who, who's not going around being cruel and insulting people. And he doesn't really care that no one knows that he's saving the world because exciting interesting mystery of it all is enough for him exciting new places and new worlds and it's exciting for him and and he is smarter than everyone he does make the doctor in doctor who makes comments about people being dumb all the time about how they have these tiny brains and they're like they don't they're not on his level but he's also not mean about it he's just like it's not your fault you're not on my level like you couldn't be you're not born with this level <laughs> so i was surprised by how much i liked the character that's i guess another reason why i didn't I really want to read it because I was like, I don't really want to read a dry, dusty tome about a jerk. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, he's really clever, but you know, and he was actually quite likable and charming in a really eccentric way. I feel like he had a good like repart repartee and banter with Watson. And yeah, I just, I, li I liked him a lot more than I thought I would. And then, yeah, then all of a sudden we go to the American West and we're reading about Mormons for like a third of the book. And I was like, what? <laughs> And of course that does all tie into it. So I would say like, obviously as a modern reader, some other tie in to like make the reader aware that this is going on, that this does tie in might be good because it doesn't. It's just like, like Sherlock Holmes has like figured it out and he's like, he's been refusing to offer information because he's like, nope, not ready yet. And then finally they kind of catch the guy 
who no one thought was the guy. And he's like, okay, we've caught him. So now whatever questions you have, now I'll answer whatever you wanna know. And then all of a sudden we cut to Mormons in Utah for like a third of the book. And I was like, I'm, when I was a little worried that again, that I had a, a janky Kindle edition, I was like, did this gets placed with a different book? Is this not a study in Scarlet or a study in Scarlet anymore? Then I kept going and I was like, this, this is probably backstory. This is probably leading somewhere. And it does. And it is part of it. And it's meant to be there. But I was like, what? Sherlock was about to tell us everything. And now we're with Mormons in Utah. What? <laughs> but even that part, I mean, like the thing that convinced me also that I didn't have a glitchy copy was that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has a really distinct uh, authorial voice, which was present still with the Mormons in Utah. And I was like, this feels like it's still written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. His style is here. So this must be related. This must be tied in somehow. And obviously it was. And then it all wrapped up and it was over. And it wasn't like unnecessarily dragging, which is what I associate with a lot of older books because everyone was just wordier and longer and they were paid by the page and or by the word or whatever so like even i love uh dumas but a lot of dumas was really long and dickens is really long because of that so i associate old books with just being needlessly long and wordy and sherlock holmes was not it got to the point it had told you the key ingredients told you the key people it very quickly almost in it's nothing like neil gaiman but i always praise people and compare them to Neil Gaiman when they can effectively paint the portrait of a character in very few words. Neil Gaiman, his, one of his strongest parts of his writing, he's obviously great at story and, and building worlds and interesting magic and stuff, but one of the things that I think is the most amazing about Neil Gaiman's writing is his brevity. The, the short amount of words in which he's able to paint a complete portrait of a place, a situation, of a magic, of a people. And so here too, the fact that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, in very few words, you, you're like, I get, I can see Sherlock. I get who Watson is. I get this mystery. All these like side characters, I'm picturing them too. Like it's, it's very concisely, but effectively describing everything to where you don't have time to be bored. And even like the minor characters that are now all backstory that you're never going to really need to know about again, because it's all just tied to this one case. So like, for future Sherlock Holmes stories, you don't need to have established who these Mormons are. But even that was told in a way that you really got quickly invested in these Mormons in Utah and in their story. And for like a hot minute there, I forgot I was reading a Sherlock Holmes book and I was just invested in them. So it's just well written. So I guess it's classic for a reason. I shouldn't be surprised. But having read a lot of classics, I am sometimes bored out of my mind. So it is refreshing when a classic is actually, it's not just like, I can see why this is a classic, but that wasn't fun. This was a lot of fun to read and I enjoyed it. And I have since purchased one of those like giant collected works of collected Sherlock Holmes mysteries or whatever. So you plow on right on through that soonish, I hope. So yeah, let me know in the comments down below if you've ever read any of the actual Sherlock Holmes stories. If you, like me, have only ever seen the adaptations or if you haven't seen either ever and you're here because you're like, what is this Sherlock Holmes that you speak of? <laughs> Please tell me more. Then, uh... I feel like I didn't explain at all who Sherlock Holmes is and this was a terrible video for you. <laughs> but let me know whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, sometimes Wednesdays. So like and subscribe and I'll see you when I see you.